to the Mixing Music Podcast. I'm your host, DK, and with me, as always, is my lovely co-host, Load Box Lou. Load me up, daddy. Okay, can you actually <laughs> read the prompt that you, you fed ChatGPT? Oh, to? yeah. Let's do this. There's a prompt. So, it's it's uh, it's kind of funny, because it's kind of like a two, two-part prompt, but basically... Studio audio gear related to the uh, studio audio related gear uh, that starts with the letter L that can be followed up with the name Lou in the likeness of Limiter Lou. It said, how about Lavalier Lou for a microphone commonly used in studio recordings? I'm like, give me a list of 20 and just to shoot them hold, off. Hold on, don't, don't share them. But he did the sorry, yeah. chat GPT did give me 20, 40. Well, you look like, you got I, like I got 60. 60 total. Nice. So we're going to be using yeah. chat GPT names. Anyway, welcome back to the Mixing Music Podcast. This is a follow-up episode to our last episode. If, if we did it in order, then the last episode was how to make your first thousand dollars in a month. Mm-hmm. This episode, we talked a little bit at the end of that last episode about networking and how you can meet more people, how you can generate more leads. So this episode is about lead generation and different ideas. I'm going to tell you right off the bat, uh, preface to this is that um, we do not, okay, there is not going to be one way to generate leads that works for you indefinitely. It's different from everybody. So this episode, I want you to think it's like more of like a think tank. Like we're helping you come up with your own ideas, what resources you have, what things that you're you have accessible to you, what kinds of people that you want to work with. Um, general idea that we want to start off with, and I'm going to use in this metaphor, this example, I'm going to talk about dating. Mm. Okay, this is going to be fun. Okay. All right. What do you think, and this is not necessarily for you, maybe a little bit of your own taste mm-hmm. here, Lou. I know we're both married here, mm-hmm. but like for the for like the average man, let's list uh, let's describe the average woman that you'd want to confident. Okay. So confident for me, intelligent is important. Mm-hmm. Smart is important. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe, um, easy to talk to nurturing, nurturing. Oh, great. Mm-hmm. Um, is uh, creative. That's important mm-hmm. for me. Uh, let's see. Into trying new things. Into trying new things. Self-disciplined. Yep. Very disciplined. Um, again, communicative. I think I said that. Honest. Honest. Oh, that's Even a good one. Even when tough. Ooh. Okay. So that's enough there. I'm going to stop us there. Um, here's the thing. Am I... This is where marketing comes into play. Mm-hmm. If I want to find a woman like that, mm-hmm. statistically, where should I go and where should I make the effort to flirt with this, t- like to find this type of woman? Tinder. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> the, I guess the first question is, is it going to be the club? Am I statistically likely to find mm. someone who is honest, caring, willing to, tr- maybe willing to try new things? Mm, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Potentially. Maybe they're there on that one night they were trying something yeah, new. Yeah, maybe. Uh, you never know. Like, uh, okay. So, but I mean, like some of the more basic ones, nurturing, yeah. caring, honest, fun to talk to, intelligent you yeah. know, uh, uh, self-disciplined. Mm-hmm. Are, is that where you're going to find the woman that you're looking for? Statistically not speaking, really. from a level of not, statistics. Not really. How about a better idea? A bookstore. Oh. A library. Or the park. A coffee shop. The park. Yeah. Maybe if they're walking their dog, they're carrying in somewhere. Yep. I mean, we're just talking about statistics, right? Yeah. People don't think about this stuff. All these fuck, fucking ignorant men, they're like, I keep finding bitches. I can't find good women. Yeah. They keep cheating on me. That's because you keep picking girls up at the club. Like, statistically, that's <laughs> not the place <laughs> to find the right, yeah. in, in other words, client yeah. and a woman, you know, like yeah. whatever. That's That sounds, that really Are makes- Are you a gigolo now? Yeah, client <laughs> said that. I mean, in the metaphor, right? Yeah, the yeah, client, yeah. right? Yeah. So it's like- so one thing that we're going to make clear mm-hmm. is that everybody, if you're thinking about this, if you come to this episode of how to find more clients, how to network and generate leads, the first thing that you need to think about is who is your ideal client? You mm-hmm. need to, on paper, there you can Google search avatar. Yep. So like how to make an avatar. An avatar is a business term that we use mm-hmm. in order to specifically describe our ideal client. I don't remember the exact when we did it with Internet oh, Studios. I, I remember many details. But of it. Me, we were, I remember many of the details too. Probably in their mid mid 
30s to 40s, like thir- mm-hmm. early 30s to late 40s. Yeah, we. I think the lowest age group we put was 27, 35. Yeah, probably uh, like a college-educated manages artists. Prefers ma- a pr- clean space. Yeah, has kids, is a family man, mm-hmm. um, is doesn't smoke, is sober. Again, we're trying to do like ideal. So like we're making up things. Yeah. And and like and there's always gonna be variables in between when you actually meet people. Nobody's the same person. Yeah, again, we're just doing ideal for one. They yeah, so like they're probably college educated, they're probably sober, they probably like to read books, yep. they probably are a coffee person rather than a drinking person. Yep. Um they yeah, again, they probably have family that they care about, so thus they have boundaries, you mm-hmm. know, they want uh, they're clean. They're they're. They're not trying to be out all night. Yeah, they're very clean in nature. Uh, they're yeah. they're on time to sessions. So, so the reason why that's important is because if you don't know what you fucking want, then this is going to make negotiate not negotiating, finding put finding leads, generating leads, networking so much more difficult. So the first yeah. step in order for to proper network to properly generate leads to best build your business is to number one, articulate, spe- articulate specifically who your ideal customer is. Yeah. Who is it that you want to talk to? And yes, there's a lot of people at the club, Yep. but the club is not where you want to go for an ideal long-term client, like a long-term no. partner that you want to eventually want to marry. Yeah. It's just not where you want to go. And if you are complaining saying that I keep getting these, these, uh, uh, trifling, trifling women, that don't want to settle down. Yeah. Uh, it's because you're looking in the wrong place. Like it's a, it's a game of statistics. It's also like, think about it. Like uh, maturity is both not just a dating example, but it's also a client example, maturity. And like the sense of like, if you're all your clients are 20 years old, they probably all act like 20 year olds. Yeah. So this is literally why it's the perfect metaphor. There's no metaphor yeah. that could ever be better than this metaphor that I yeah. just came up with. Exactly. This is peak metaphor, right? <laughs> uh, anyway, so this is something that you need to think about. And this is part of the reason why it's going to be different for everybody and why it should be different for everybody. Ideal client for Lou, I mean, especially now you're focusing a lot more on mastering, is different for me, who's like a pop mixing guy. You may eventually, like, I don't know, like you're, I don't know what you're into recently, but you like r b no, I love R&B. You like um, Bunda stuff? Up, yeah, I grew up listening to just about every genre, mainly like rock and stuff, which always makes me laugh. Cause but as far as like work my goes. Make, my main breadwinner is actually like pop R&B. There you go. And for yeah. me, it's like recently, it's like pop rock, pop EDM, pop in general, just pop yeah. singing, just straight. Singing. Straight pop. No subgenre. Singing. Pop. Uh, anyway, just singers. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so... um. And then again, that niche is I'm a mixer. So like clients that are ideal for me, uh, people that are my, f- my favorite client mm-hmm. is uh, usually has a manager. Um, there's usually no negotiating on pricing. They yeah. just agree to it. They're quick with revision requests. They're quick mm-hmm. with turn. They're not only am I quick with turnarounds, but they're quick with their turnarounds as well. Um, they respect my boundaries. No weekends, yeah. no late nights. Um, they're easy to work with. They're talking I actually like their music. Right. So how do I find that ideal clientele? Mm, I guess a good starting point would be social media. Well, if you got to like their music and you got to like their persona, part of their marketing ties into that. Who do they, uh, who do they want people to perceive them as? Yeah. I meant to make that question more rhetorical, but I'm glad that you answered it. Uh, but the point is like, (laughs) I mean, if your branding is throwing money everywhere, but then you're also the type of person to uh, really try to renegotiate a price because it's too expensive, but you just bought three thousand dollars shoes, um, which don't have any return on investment. Maybe it doesn't align with your goal. Oh, okay. Hold on. Wait a second. Wait a second. Wait a second. Me saying that three thousand dollars shoes don't have a return on investment, saying like that, all your Pokemon cards are a waste of money. No, they low key are at the same time as the shoes are. As oh, they only make you money when you sell them. But if you're gonna wear them and break uh, them down, they have no return on investment. It, got, it, got it. Yeah. If you do so, wear them, that's true. Yeah. If you wear them, they instantly lose value. It's like a Ferrari. You don't buy a Ferrari from the dealership to flip it. You buy a used one and flip it. 
So uh, that being said, I am proud to say that I am coming up on four years of haven't bought a pair of sneakers. Hell yeah. But all your sneakers are much have, cleaner than mine. Yeah. And I, I still, well, I mean, I bet by like running shoes and basketball shoes because they were worn out. Anyway, yeah. but the point is, the point is, okay. So if, if that is the case, we also need to take it back a step further. If I want to find someone that works with management, an artist that has a manager, so I communicate, mm-hmm. mostly delegate uh, work or receive work through managers, mm-hmm. then what I need to do is be a type of service that is appropriate for managers. Yeah. Meaning what managers want is I don't want to have to follow up with you all the time. Yeah. I want you to send the files and you don't ask any questions and it's, you're just fucking easy to work with. Yep. Literally, managers are willing to take less of a percent if you are just easy to work with. Liter- like yeah. literally my manager, he's like, DK, you are, you're so easy to work with. I'm actually going to take less of a percent. Nice. Literally, that was his argument. And I said, yeah. okay, cool. I wasn't going to argue. I was going to offer to give him more, but he was like, you know what? Let's keep this going. This is so easy. Oh yeah. It's so nice. Anyway, um, Okay, so let's th- let's talk about this. The the average listener right now, um, you're trying to make. Let's go back to the last episode. So you're trying to make your first thousand dollars. So you're at like a beginner, intermediate stage, maybe low mm-hmm. intermediate beginner stage, right? It doesn't matter. Um, and you're wanting to go full time with music. Mm-hmm. Where are you going to generate leads? Well, first off, if you don't have a niche yet, which is pretty common, like you you haven't decided, like you're doing mixing and mastering and you're doing producing and you're tracking all in your home space or, or commercial space and yeah. um, you do all genres except mm-hmm. for, and then you have a few that you don't do, right? So let's run with that. Um, typically, your ideal client is going to be someone local, not on the internet. I don't mm-hmm. know. I like working with people that I can meet. There's less revision requests. There's more respect because they know yep. you personally. Um, they perform often locally. They're serious yep. about their art, mm-hmm. right? So they release music constantly. Yeah. Where am I going to find... And, and there's going to be a lot more specific things that's going to be dependent on your location, depending on your situation. Mm-hmm. Um, but where am I going to find someone like that, Lou? Someone who releases music. Let's just stick with the easy mm-hmm. ones. Releases music consistently, plays shows often, um, is serious about their craft. And, uh, um, I would... Firstly, just say, start going to events. Like, yeah. actually go see them perform. And and I would be even more specific. What about you go, mm-hmm. t- if you live near a university, mm-hmm. go to your local university and go to open mics around the clubs around the university. Yeah. To the, the coffee shops around the university, to go to the events around the university. Mm-hmm. These are going to be usually young, hungry artists. They may not have a big budget, but if it's perfect because if they can get a very cheap mix out of you mm-hmm. um, and you feel like you can over-deliver for them, that's a great situation to be. And then people that are young, honestly, if they stick it to it, yeah. you're developing... Uh, a long-term client. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And the cool thing, that's one thing that we should talk about too, is like 90% of my clients are mm-hmm. people that are my peers that have also elevated their careers like yeah. I have. The 10% of them are like people that are significantly above me that were given to me mm-hmm. or I had a chance to win over mm-hmm. or someone got fired or something like that. Yeah. Um, but most of my clients, especially the ones that pay well, are people that started with me at a young age at the same mm-hmm. level and we both increased our work. I, I would actually say that's actually the best way to actually grow. I know it's a long-term thing. I think it's an inevitable hard. thing. It, yeah, it's a hard one to see at first. Um, and I've always told people this, and I, I think I've repeated this notion to you. Like, I can trace back all of my major successes back to, like, even when I got my first studio when I was 20. You know, like, I, I can tie it all back person to person to person. I know every little connection that everyone went through how we met, how we worked together, and what made the difference. But it's only something that you can tie back after so much time later. It's not something that you can see right away where it's like, well, they're going to go and do this in the future. No, like uh, the most recent major project I did uh, was the Zeus project, right? Um, The guy that got me connected there was working with the management company. By the way, way, preface, um, Zeus is a... TV Audio, TD, T, what is it? It's a TV network. TV network company that built uh, a group of studios and Lou built out these studios. So yeah. Zeus is the name of the company that owns these studios. Yeah. Um, and so um, it, it's kind of funny because like even that guy, we never actually exchanged funds. He just knew all the work that I did surrounding the people that he knows. And because of that, I was top of mind even years later. 
because I was always known as the guy that's willing to help. Even if it's not my personal job or anything, I just wanted to make sure people were good. Yeah. That, that's and that's a big deal. So again, that's something this I don't the only problem with this is that these generalized ideas that you should be thinking about is significantly more important than the actual specific practical advice that we're about to give you. Yeah. Because if you don't have a generalized understanding of who your target demographic is, who your ideal avatar is, your ideal client is, then there's no point of networking. And, and now eventually you're going to use these ideas and use that knowledge, your avatar, your ideal client, your boundaries. You're going to use that knowledge to then build on and and find specific ways that work for you. Anyway, what I recommend anybody to do right now is if you are listening to the podcast, I recommend that you go pull up your browser or download the app. Chat GPT mm-hmm. now has an app. It's free. You can sign in with your Google account. It's totally free. Three, Chat GPT 3.5 is totally free. 4.0 yeah. you pay for, but you don't need it. Okay. And I want you to type in this. What are some ideas for networking and meeting potential clients as an audio engineer or as a mix engineer or as a mastering engineer or as a live, whatever your thing is? Just start there. And here's what ChatGPT spit out with. Number one, attend industry events. Conferences, trade shows, and seminars related to music, audio engineering, and the entertainment industry are excellent places to meet potential clients. Look for events in your area of travel to major industry hubs. Mm -hmm. The only thing that I'm going to qualify with this is that going to audio engineering events is not as useful because audio engineers are not your clients. Unless you're a mastering engineer. Unless you are a mastering engineer. There you go. Yeah. I did a poll of like who hires the mastering engineer, artist or the engineers. And I put it in the con, uh, made two polls, one for the artist answer, one for engineer's answer. Both sides answered that the engineers, <laughs> which was kind of yeah. a great. So, yeah. yeah. So, unless you're a master engineer, the only thing, and again, this is something that I admit to all the time on the podcast is that I started this podcast for fun. But if I was starting this podcast as a business to, in order to monetize my audience, mm-hmm. then I would have done how to songwrite, how to produce, how to record, mm-hmm. because those are the type of, so like I made the fatal flaw of making content for my peers. Again, if I'm trying to monetize my audience, that was the worst business move possible. Uh, it depends on your approach to what the goal is. I'm, I don't really sell courses. Eventually I yeah. may. If, yeah. if I start selling a plugin, then this would have been good, you know, yeah. but I still haven't finished building my plugins yet. That's on a little bit of a hold till mm. later in the year. Um, and uh, I haven't, I don't make courses. So it's like, unless that's my product, but I'm a mix engineer. I take on clients. If you're listening to this podcast, you're trying to mix for yourself. It's, it's yeah. not as good um, as a, anyway. So it's something to think about. If you know, if you know who your ideal client is, you probably won't uh, go to an audio engineering event. Number two is join professional organizations. Whoa. Mm. Consider joining organizations like Audio Engineering Society, AES, or local music industry associations. These organizations often host events and provide network opportunities. Yeah. A buddy of mine joined their local uh, city council mm-hmm. as like the arts guy or something like that. Mm-hmm. And he said that he gets clients from that. Like he hosts an open mic or some sort of art show once a month for the city. Mm -hmm. Um, And every once in a while, people, he gets clients from that. That's a great idea. Yeah. Um, Online communities. This is big. Mm -hmm. Participate in online forums, social media groups, and platforms like LinkedIn. What the fuck? To connect with fellow audio professionals and potential clients. Again, this is actually not good. If you're looking for potential clients as an audio engineer, you don't necessarily want to connect with audio, audio, other audio professionals. Okay, so if your ideal client is an artist Mm -hmm. who is posting on social media, is actively releasing music and promoting stuff all the time, then whether you like it or not, one main place to network is on Instagram. And yeah. TikTok. I don't give a shit how much you hate it. Your potential clients are probably there. I'm going to give a little pushback to the to the previous notion. I think it's a really good idea to network with your peers. Reason being is that some people have a little more work on their table than they can handle or need assistance with it. If you're starting out, then if you wanted to network with bigger names, get yourself into a bigger room as an assistant would be one way. And you can actually meet their management, understand how the management works, what they're looking for and things of that nature and know how to grow towards something. But, um, you know, we think about like our friends like shock and Jeff and everybody where they're doing well on their own, but they also have a sense of like, yo, they were working for their peers. 
Yeah, so it's going to be totally dependent. Yeah. I would say very little of my work it comes from peers. Um, and most of it, like, no, mix engineers are not hiring me. It's usually the mix engineer talks, they, they know me yeah. or something it's like, like that. like, hey, I can't take it on, but I got a friend. Not even can. that. Not even that. I, mm. I have a, it's more like, hey, I'm not your genre. Mm-hmm. I don't want to do this. Can you do this? Or, um, and the more that I charge, it's less and less so. Because yeah. it used to be, hey, there's this one audio engineer in my local area that charges more, that used mm-hmm. to charge more than me. And he's like, hey, this guy is, I don't, he doesn't have as much of a budget. Can you just take him on? I just don't want to take him on right now. I don't have the, yeah. the time. So like, yeah, overflow in that sense. But again, like about one, like less than 5% of my income for me specifically, it's, yeah, it's yeah. different for everybody, but that's some, that's a good point to make in general, the general business ideas don't market to your peers, but for Lou and maybe for you, it has worked. I will say in general, that is a generalized idea. Okay. Online communities is huge. I don't know why it brought up LinkedIn. Holy cow. Chat GPT sucks. Uh, four, collaborate with musicians and bands, partner with local musicians and bands to record, mix, master their music. No shit, Sherlock. Okay. Number five, offer workshops and classes. That we is something that. that we both do. Yeah. That's a really great way to bring people in. It not only does it build trust by showcasing that you know what the fuck you're doing, mm-hmm. but you get to meet people that are openly potentially interested in whatever service you provide. Yeah. Um, okay, studio open houses. We also do that. Yeah. That's a great way for as far as like if I if my the income revenue, I don't do that for my mixing. But for Mm -hmm. the studio where our income is based off of rental of the studio, showing the space is a great way to show people that we have a good space. Oh, yeah. Open houses. Great. Number seven, volunteering for local events. Volunteer to provide sound engineering service for local concerts, festivals, and community events. This can help you get the name out there and establish connections. I've done this a bunch of times. I'll tell you about it in a second. Go ahead. Yeah, it's a double-edged sword, though. Um, In its perception of your role in your industry. If you are doing a ton of live sound and everybody that you met doing live sound also probably thinks you have tinnitus. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, if you go and volunteer at this event and you're the one person not wearing hearing protection, you're probably less likely to be considered by somebody who knows you should be protecting your ears okay. if you're going to work in audio. Okay. Okay. I have a serious question. Yeah. Serious question, Lou. And I, and I, this may be like a soft, vulnerable spot, but I have to ask. Sure. As someone that does do live sound, mm-hmm. do you feel like there's a lack of respect or there is a line between someone that is a purebred studio rat and like someone that is hybrid or does live sound? Like, do, like what you just okay. described, is that yeah. a real thing? So there is a line and this is kind of what I've seen it as. Like, do you f- really feel like you doing live, sa- live sound on the side affects your income as an, an uh, I would say it in the sense of the context of this episode, which is networking, right? If everybody you met there is like, oh, you do live sound. Oh, you also own a studio. Okay. Which one of the two do you do better? Which one of the two? Because I've only seen you in this light. So I know you're charging X amount per day to mix uh, shows and I know uh, groups hire you to come and do that. But live sound technology is though inherently the same as studio technology, but it's very, very different in its workflow mentality and the approach. How you handle one event for a thousand people versus how you mix a song is two completely different conversations because you're not dealing with stage bleed. You're not dealing with monitor mixes that can't go into the audience sound. Um, There's so many things that go into it that those who are looking for a mixing engineer are probably looking for somebody who works in a quiet environment on a regular basis that protects their hearing all the time. And because of that, live sound can give the perception of, oh, this person might not take care of their ears so much. You know, you hear about all the veteran live sound engineers that are deaf because hearing protection wasn't a thing in the 80s for whatever reason. But anytime anybody sees me in headphones, they're always like, dude, do you not just listen to the speakers? I'm like, I only need to hear it for like five minutes just to know that my mix was right. You know, but finding clients as a live sound engineer can be more damaging for your long term if you're trying to niche into mixing. You're not going to find them in the live sound events. 
Also, yeah, like I was thinking too, it's like the people who hire you at Live Sound is more like venue owners. Yep. And so like- They're not managers for the artist's recording career. They're there for their live and performing careers. Yeah, you don't typically talk to the person that would no. hire you for mixing. So it doesn't really cross yeah. over. Now, much. where it does cross over is when you get to network with the musicians themselves who are locals. So for instance, you know so, okay, that- Okay, so specifically who are locals. Yes. Uh, reason being is this. Uh, there are touring musicians and there are local musicians now the ones that left on tour are obviously getting their tour rates but you're never going to see them again outside of one show so there's no point in promoting your recording or mixing services to them unless you can do it remotely once again the mixing or mastering but when it comes to the musicians they're like oh yeah you know um i live in glendale right we'll just say in the area of the venue um and i actually do a lot of like uh, drum session work and that's how I got connected to this gig it's like oh that's crazy I actually mainly do uh, studio mastering and all that kind of stuff I actually own a studio with multiple rooms and I actually specialize in like recording live uh, drums that's actually my favorite thing to record uh, instrument wise like that's the real truth of mine so connecting with the drummers and saying like hey if you'd ever like to come by and check it out and like let me know what you think like I'd love to get your opinion and you can really impress them with your space and really showcase the part outside of the venue. But to get to that conversation, you also had to have a smooth event where everybody's happy. You got their monitors right. Everything was so easy to work with that they're like, yo, who is this guy? So there is an opportunity to network, but it's not as fluent as other methods. Like live sound, unfortunately, is not going to get you uh, more clients in the studio right away. It can over time, but what it is going to do is get you to be better and think on your feet faster, which is going to turn, make you a better studio engineer. Yeah, I, that yeah, that crossover is good. But as far as like, yeah. Thank you, Lou. I was just curious yeah. about that. That was an actual genuine curiosity. Yeah. Okay, number... Oh, one thing that I did do mm -hmm. that I want to talk about is when I was in a band, mm -hmm. right? And so my ideal client, I wanted to play shows. Mm -hmm. My ideal client at the time was other bands that would ask us to open for them. Mm -hmm. would be uh, event uh, like event promoters, event promoters, event makers, people mm -hmm. that have made the events and hosted the events. Um, so one way that I knew to get into their hearts and to negotiate my band playing, which was the goal, is that I bought a PA system mm -hmm. and bought some like yep. sound, and so I would leverage that and be like, "Hey, we are doing this show out in the uh, out in the um, you know on the university field. Uh, we need a PA system. It's like, hey, well, I'll provide this PA system for free if you let us open for you." Yeah. Or like, so I was able to leverage my skill and equipment in order to get more gigs. Or like, hey, this event, this apartment complex is doing like a big backyard bash for this university here. Uh, DK, can you help do the sound? Yeah, can you let us play? And there was often times that it would be like a dance party and there mm -hmm. was a huge audience because it's not like local bands. It's this yeah. proper dance party and we would open or like somehow play something in the middle so we had a bigger audience than normal Yeah, because we leveraged the speaker. Anyway, that's another thing. Another way that I've volunteered for local events that got me clients as well as like respect and trust is that I would often... Um, give away free studio hours or free mm -hmm. mixes or whatever in exchange to uh, to sponsor a battle of the band. So I yeah. would go to all of the local battle of the bands and I would ask if I could sponsor them and I would be there all week or all weekend and judge each person, give them good feedback, make sure they know who I am and the winners would get um, the prize and I would do that. Sometimes they didn't even use it, but which was yeah. awesome because then I just got to sponsor it and got all that PR for free. Uh, but anyway, that was another way that you can volunteer for local events. Number eight is collaborate with content creators. This is huge. This is one mm -hmm. of the ways that we make music, make money from the studio specifically, not us as, well, I mean, us with as engineers as well mm -hmm. with the podcast, for example, but this is big for the studio. Even this last week, we've had people, we have one video that we collaborated with, with a buddy of mine who is not a music a YouTube channel. He does general tech mm -hmm. um, and learning type channel. And he came in and, like, and talked about how is it worth going to a big studio in LA? And he did a video about us. It's like, if you type in LA recording studios, we're the number one hit because of it. And we get a lot of paying clients because of that. Yeah, It's a huge deal. Uh, attend music showcases. I feel like that's going to book events. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Create an online presence. That's a no-brainer. Yeah. Showcasing your portfolio service and client testimonials. Use social media platforms to showcase your work. It's something simple like having a demo reel, like show. If yeah, you I'm not going to lie. I got to get better at updating mine. 
Yeah, or like um, even if you take the time, if you ask permission and do like before and afters yeah, as like shorts on Instagram or put yeah. it on YouTube and put that on your like YouTube hyperlink on your website, yeah. like before and after examples. Uh, offer free consultations. I know a lot of people that do this. Mm-hmm. Hey, a uh, couple ways to do this as a mix engineer is you offer a free, uh, what is it called? If you have FilePass, which is one of our sponsors, mixingmusicpodcast.com mm-hmm. slash FilePass, you can block downloads so unless they pay for it. Yeah. So you can do paywalls. So you can be like, hey, I'm willing to do a free mix and you only have to pay for it if you like it. Yeah. If you want to use it, then that's the only time. But you get to hear my offering for free. And if you got mm-hmm. a lot of time on your hands or if you're not, you got the time budget too, that's a great Or way. if there's a specific client that you feel is out of your league but you'd like to shoot your shot. There it's, you go. It's no different than, once again, uh, you're trying to find this girl. You feel you might not be up to par for it. Shoot your shot. You there know, you worst thing is you hear the word no. No, the worst thing is, ew, you gross son of a bitch. Why are you even talking to me? Get <laughs> yeah, your fat actually, ass out of here. That's actually, the worst that, that would make my my emotions drop a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> the like, worst oh, thing. I'm going to go to Chipotle. <laughs> that's like a classic meme. What's the, no, is the wor- what's the worst thing that they can say? No. And then I was like, <laughs> ew, you gross bitch. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's like, oh. <laughs> anyway, uh, but that's a really great thing. As a mastering engineer, yeah. it's pretty common for to do the same thing where it's like you offer one free song mastering. Um, oftentimes they leave like some sort of like audio watermark yeah. by saying like master by blah, 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 and they leave that and it's gross and you don't get it the clean audio without without paying for it. Things like that. Just make sure that you properly communicate that. I don't recommend doing things for free. Yeah. But I would recommend doing, giving them the option to hear your work for free and they only have to use so it. So what if I've they pay done is uh, I'll master the chorus and it'll be the final chorus because that's where all the oh, energy and everything's going. Um, I'll do a fade in, fade out kind of thing at the top of the chorus that's a great idea. and end of the chorus. And it's simple. And then uh, in that same link, there's a zip file to the master. There you go. So it's like, yeah, you offer, you get a free consultation. Yep. And you offer, again, I don't recommend doing free work as much as like offer to showcase your work for free and then they only have to pay if they like what you do. Yeah. That's a great way of doing it. Sometimes they're not going to pay for it and they don't like what you do, and but that's, that's a good okay. learning experience. Yeah. yeah. Um, 12, attend gear gem demonstrations. Again, that's more, if you're a mastering engineer, that's more important. But again, mm. these are ideas based off of like, if you're a mixer, who is your client? Usually yeah. managers, usually yeah. the artists themselves. They're not going to gear demonstrations. So- it's uh, not that, that you're not going to find gonna clients lie. there, I but it's a statistics game. There. I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't not half as much as I've posted on like Instagram, but I think I've it, have, you know, I've found I think you. we would both describe these clients as red flag clients, though. Fair, um, fair. Uh, where it's like, oh, I'm just out here looking at like the latest technology, the best vocal chains, this and that, and it's like, oh, great, yeah, I actually, you know, work with this company. I actually use their mics, this and that. It's like, oh, cool. Uh, just out of curiosity, how much do you charge is that? They might come to the studio, but then once something new, flashy else comes out, they're on that train. So they're they're more train riding than they are, you know, clients. There you go. Yeah. It's true. And number 13, I'm going to say, this is a bad one again. The G- chat GPT did not listen to our advice about thinking about learning. who your audience is. It's still good, but build a relationship with music studios. I guess that's good. I don't know how you're going to get mixing clients from that. I well, di- I didn't specifically say mix engineer. I said audio engineer. Yeah. So like if you're trying to get hired by the studio, that's a good thing. Um, anyway, number 14, leveraging your alumni network or going. I think the only reason why going to music school is good, like 90% of the value of a music school is your peers. I'll be honest. I think I only talked to one person out of like the 70 that were in my class. Really? Yeah. No, dude. I like still to this day, no. 30 to 50% of my clients is like past peers or alumni or things like that. I think my class was or just- Or led, was built from that. Yeah. I think my class was just unfortunately like, um, we were in a very transitional period of the school property where we were uh, leaving one property, okay. entering a new one. And because of that, there was like a lot of drop-offs. There was a lot of like miscommunication, sour taste towards the school. So like there was- really no reason to connect outside of like if you really like somebody or not um and at the time i was working full time i was going to school i owned a studio and this and that so i also didn't really have a lot of time to just like hang out 
Yeah. So, I mean, even if you didn't have time to hang out, like for me, it's not just the people that I, that my peers, my, my, in Japanese, we say doki, my same classmates. Mm-hmm. It was the fact that I went to the school, I hang out with other people that went to that school or the person that offers a different service recommended me to someone they, they yeah. trusted me because we went to the same school and they saw my work ethic as a student, yeah. you know? So it's not I direct mean, student. I'm making money from my classmates. It's that's a great networking basis. Yeah. And a we base, also get like level interns from yeah. the school too. Oh yeah. We get so interns funny enough. School, yeah. There's also generational differences, but there's going to be like, Hey, you know what? We all went to the same school. We all can talk about like the class, how things have changed, this and that. So there's still like something to connect on. Yeah. And number yeah. 15, this is a uh, really good is just cold outreach. And I'm going to specify with this is if you want to work with someone, if you have an ideal client and mm-hmm. they're, You know, just DM them, just email them. Don't be pushy. Don't brown nose. Um, But at the very least, just like say hi. And I I mean, they're going to say no. The worst they can say is to call you a little gross bitch. But I mean, like at the very least, (laughs) it's it's, it's worth asking. It's worth asking. And if you are doing a good job, if you do have good presence, if you look reliable, then honestly, I have had many a clients just from asking. Yeah. It's it's really insane. And um, some of those are still lifelong clients. Yeah. To be honest, like, I think the more you actually enjoy who you work with, ultimately will generate the return business. Because it really does, I guess, show in your version of how you communicate with people. Everybody com- communicates differently. Some people are more the silent type, but they just have their little tells when, like, they like somebody, you know? And yeah. some people are very vocal and uh, some people are very, like you know, hand on the shoulder, physical kind of thing. But the more you actually like the people you're working with, the better off you're going to be in the long run. Yeah. I will say though, I block anyone, anyone and everyone that promotes without starting a conversation. They're like, Hey, watch this video. Hey, like my pre-save my work. And they didn't even say hi. Hell no. I fucking hate you. I will never, ever like your music. Anytime I get those emails, I'm like, hi, uh, the next time you guys email me, like, please at least even have any kind of remote sense of what my name is. Yeah. I restrict you and never see your messages. In fact, one of these episodes, I should call people out by their names because they probably still listen to the podcast. Hmm. And I should call them out by name. Be like, you suck. Suddenly you see the comments like, no, you are a bad human being. Anyway. um, But anyway, at the same time, like, just be friendly. Just try to make friends. Just say that you're interested again. Compliment them. Yeah. Like, hey, I love I love the music video that you did out. Who did it? Who mm-hmm. worked on it? They'll always, most people would love to talk about themselves and how they were able to make this project that they're really proud of. Yeah. You know, it's a great way to get interested. Don't, and again, make it easy on yourself and for them by don't even promoting your own work. They're going to find out. If yeah. you have a good brand, a good portfolio, and, and it's pretty obvious if you go to your cha- channel, and they will tell you if they're looking for an engineer. Yeah. Hey man, I saw that you're an engineer. Um, can I hire? What are, What are your rates? They will. They will. If they are someone that is going to hire you, they will ask themselves. Yeah. They'll qualify themselves. So again, just reach out and be friendly. Um, don't try to sell. Yeah. Okay. And I think that's a great end to this episode. This is a little bit shorter episode. We thank you so much for listening. If you are interested in listening to more episodes of the podcast and specifically about mixing and mastering, producing. Um, tips and tricks and takeaways and homework, go to mixingmusicpodcast.com slash exclusive, where James, Braden, and I will break down different audio clips from various uh, award-winning engineers or local engineers. And we talk about why it's a good idea, why it's a bad idea. Anyway, for $4 a month or $40 a year, you get access to twice as many episodes. Some, uh, so there it is. Mm-hmm. Go to one more time. That's mixingmusicpodcast.com slash exclusive. Also, if you are a longtime listener of the podcast and really love what we do and want to support the podcast, go to your favorite um, platform, whether you use Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify. Please just leave five-star rating. And if you are able to, Spotify doesn't allow this, but if you're on Apple or Google, just leave one sentence. Hey guys, love the show. Mm-hmm. Um, just it's better for the algorithm if you leave a remark than to just leave five stars. So if you do that for us, that really does help us um, grow the show. We really appreciate it. We've been doing this for a long time now. We're coming yeah. up on episode, what is it? Public episode number 250. I think this episode is 245. So like in five more episodes, we'll have 250 public publicly released episodes. Yeah. Um, so we appreciate your support. We hope to make hundreds more potentially a lot more than that so thank you for your time your support we love you happy mixing my friends and stay saucy